very much for you know, echo everybody's thoughts here. And being the last of this question, I can. Uh, it better be an amazing answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a little bit from everybody and begin. So I'll, uh, I'll take uh, uh, Reverend McLeus's first uh, comment, answer your question directly. I, I also hope so. Uh, and I think on some level, just uh, just to be brief here, so we can have a bigger conversation afterwards, is uh, that in some ways, in representing. Uh, Hindu and Jain traditions, and to some extent, and also to a great extent, if not completely, also in parts that aren't represented here, such as the Buddhist traditions, which are you know Southeast Asia. All, all three of these traditions are, um, uh, as as the rabbi was saying, are on some levels deeply linked with empathy, because the ultimate goal for all of these traditions is to is to free yourself from unhappiness and. They often and they recognize that the old that uh, everyone's unhappiness and happiness is interconnected with other people's happiness and unhappiness. Mm -hmm. So, if that is the case, then in some level, you know, if you recognize your own uh, condition and others' condition, then there's no other way but to be empathetic, unless one is sadistic or sort of masochistic okay with being unhappy, which uh, of course is another issue altogether. Um, and so that, that's something which I think uh, is a general thing which uh, I think connects up all these traditions that at some level is scope, as the rabbi mentioned, for some kind of contribution of, to the world for, from religion. Uh, now the other thing is as far as the specificity, uh, I mean on some level I think uh, these traditions have been good for the world and, we, and in fact have uh, been embraced by other traditions as well, if not in their distilled form. I mean, one of the things which, uh, you know, the whole idea of uh, relieving one's unhappiness through active practice, through uh, observing the causes of unhappiness, Things of uh, you know dealing with uh, skillful and unskillful, healthy and unhealthy emotions, and uh, thoughts which, if sustained, lead to positive action, and thoughts if sustained with negative action. All of this is subsumed by this term yoga, <coughs> mindfulness, whatever you want to call it, which is now integrated into medical schools, <laughs> people of various religions practicing these things, and it's good because it doesn't belong to anybody. I think that's one of the great things about anything which is valuable in any religion. It doesn't really belong to anybody. There's no such thing as uh, empathy or, or uh, peace or love which any one religion possesses in some way that if it only belongs to them then maybe something is not particularly but it's, it is the product of humanity. So these traditions and you know fortunately for you know thousands of years now have cultivated special practices which other traditions also have. I mean, so that, you know, we teach courses in comparative contemplative practices, and, you know, Christians, Jews, Muslims, everybody has had practices, meditation practices, recollection practices, and various sorts, which are prayer is part of that. So everybody, it, it exists everywhere. Uh, particular forms of sort of intense engagement with these practices have been, have, have, you know, been assimilated by others and given their own form, and they've been helpful for people. So I assume that that's a really good contribution. Anything which helps us, you know, have specific technique, not just a lip service, but technique to deal with emotions in a good and in a, in a bad way, it only help. And so that's one contribution that I think religion does have, because oftentimes these things don't get developed outside of religion. People don't learn how to pray in college. They're not coming to take a, you know, introduction to prayer 101, in which maybe they should. This might be more important than you know, microbiology. <laughs> <laughs> I hope someone in the DP covers that. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question too, though? Yeah. I think you're right that. And I have one story just to, just to finish, just because of the uh, story that the rabbi said. Uh, as far as the, uh, uh, you know, embracing, I think one other thing about religion is that um, there's a story of one of these, uh, they call them a Shankarachari, one of these, uh, you know, if you want to call it, they often call them Hindu popes, but it's kind of a false uh, analogy. But these are just these leaders of a particular group of, of uh, you know, 
know, very influential uh, teaching and doctor. And somebody had come to him and wanted to become, uh, wanted to enter into that tradition and convert. As it were. And he, uh, you know, he, his, his response was, you know, um, you know, we'll embrace you if you want, but, but, uh, but better to go into the tradition that you were born in and really try to be a better, you know, to, to Try to really see where you can find the, uh, the the things you're looking for within that, because there is no, in some level, you know, there is a unified religion, as as the Imam was saying, that it has to be something of mankind. It cannot be limited to a Islamic You know, I, I I have met students over the years who point to yoga and meditative practices as saving their lives. But I also have seen the other side where people feel like yoga has been coached and, 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 and taken in a way that's sort of disrespectful, um, where sort of, you know, one aspect of it is pulled out and the rest of a deep tradition is forgotten. It, is, what do you think about that? I don't know. I mean, you know, does the guy who invented the microwave feel coached? And everyone's using the microwave now, you know? Or, uh, you know, whatever. It's just like, uh, <laughs> I mean, and Jane have to get over that, in my opinion. In my opinion, it's like, you know, but the problem is, is that if it's only an egotistical thing, like it belongs to us, that's different than, than you know, using the, uh, the names of these things and kind of, uh, you know, directing them towards, in a way, that's disrespectful. For example, these things are not meant to, you know, run a big business. You know, yoga is become a big business, right? Selling, selling little ohms and stuff has become a big business, and, they, right. and, it's, and that's fine. You know, it's a, you know, like business and like, you know, worldly life is not somehow has to be distinct from religious life, and that's another big issue. How do you integrate worldly life, business into religious life? You know, it's not like they're two separate things. They don't have to be. But I mean, I guess it's more about intention. Well, what's how somebody's feeling? What somebody's doing with it? How they uh, how they be, how they live with it? You know? I mean, there are some people who uh, live in complex ways with each other. So it's a, I don't know. It's a good question. But uh, we got a whole panel on the commodification of yeah. religion. <laughs>